the process um, took, took quite a long time, and if you know anything about Shay's work, um, you would find that fitting. Shay's most well known for a series of one year long uh, performances which he made in the late uh, 70s and early 80s. And um, the, the, the process uh, for this piece took considerably longer than a year. Um, but um, the, this piece that I'm going to read today called Being in Relation relates uh, specifically to uh, what's often called the rope uh, piece, a piece where Shea was tied uh, to the artist Linda Montano for a year. Um, you'll see as I read it that there is a motif uh, running through the piece uh, which is to do with uh, dialogue. And um, in particular, the writing uh, emerged from two different dialogues. One, of course, um, with De Ching around his work, and I'm very grateful um, for his contribution to this uh, writing and for his openness about his work in relationship to my, my questions. But also, I'm very grateful to uh, Noemi Solomon, whose um, support throughout that process um, was an important dialogue in the creation of the writing. Um, so, um, what you need to know is that the piece that Shay made before this piece is often called the outdoor piece, in which he stayed for a year um, outside without any shelter and moved around um, New York. In the process of his wanderings through the streets of Manhattan, Shay had begun to conceive a further one-year performance, but one that would require a new mode of being, a leap from the solitary dynamics of his previous work. Shay wanted to be tied in duration to another artist. Early in 1983, he encountered Linda Montana, a performance artist who'd been making work from the material of her everyday life. Montano had a childhood steeped in the Roman Catholic faith and had trained as a nun before leaving this vocation for another, a practice of living art. Influenced by the works of Marcel Duchamp, Alan Caprao, and John Cage, Montano had turned her home with her husband, Mitchell Payne, into an art museum. This play with the legality of titling, appropriating, of naming, would recur throughout Montano's subsequent works in which her life was declared a living sculpture through a Duchampian speech act. Montano saw the work with Shea as an opportunity to extend her meditations on the relation between art and life. Significantly for Shea, Montano had already made work that explored the dynamics of intimate constraint and sensory alteration. In 1973, she'd spent three days handcuffed to Tom Marioni, and in 1975, she had created a work in which she was blindfolded for a similar duration. Nine months after the close of Shea's last year-long performance, Shea and Montano embarked on what they called Art Life, one year performance, 1983 to 1984, releasing a joint statement and shaving their heads. In this work, they were to be tied by a rope, a mere eight feet in length for the duration. The inaugural declaration of this union, union also stipulated that whilst they would remain in the same room when inside, they would not touch throughout the course of the year. The rope's joints were sealed with the metal clasp and engraved with witness signatures. Now familiar witness statements were produced at the end of the year to certify that the bond had not been broken. Daily documentary strategies were also deployed. The terms under which this life work was conducted are a meeting of two sensibilities and can be read as a durational investigation of aesthetic, social, and political difference. In constraining their lives in this way, Shea and Montano made a test site of their subjectivities and their relations. As the double is the principal figure of this work, its reading tends to proceed through notions of opposition. As a work of artists of distinct genders, it's tempting to read this piece as a commentary on gender relation and on the inequities of power therein inscribed. Equally, as an internet as an inter-ethnic binding. The work can be read as an investigation of the stakes of ethnic difference in social relations within a multicultural society. Given Shea's legal immigrant status, this work has also been interpreted as a reflection of the politics of assimilation into found land cultures and the reorientation of processes of belonging. 
In each instance, the symbolic freight of the rope indicates a social imperative, a forceful creation of affinity through an external power. But it's worth noting that the rope is a crossing between subjects, and as such implies a certain reversible movement or relay. The rope subjects both subjects to similar restraints and phenomenological conditions. Though these constraints were necessarily embodied and experienced differently. While Shea's earlier works had severely moderated audience contact through the duration, this work was distinct in both assimilating performance extensively into the processes of everyday life, whilst simultaneously creating something of an unusual spectacle to be seen by, by many, however accidentally. Regardless of its conditions of spectatorship, the metaphorics of this intersubjective binding are highly open, and Shea and Montano's physical positioning of the tie, not a cuffing or leashing or harnessing, actively sustained the question of its meaning. Traversing their waistlines like an umbilical cord, the rope insistently posed the question of human interdependency. Approaching the rope piece through its kinetic, intersubjective and kinesthetic dynamics, rather than primarily through its symbolic or representational background, enables a more expansive understanding of what might be at stake in this durational binding of two bodies and two subjectivities. If Shea's outdoor piece was a choreography characterized both by aimless lingering and exploratory drift, it enacted and exhibited Shea's profound ambivalence of relation towards the social body, and indeed, the bodies of others. Shea, um, previously Shea, admitted only a meager sociality into his work in order to preserve its aesthetic, existential, and epistemological integrity. In the outdoor piece, his wandering was conducted at the peripheries of the social. He barely sustained an affinity with other marginalized subjects, propelled to the edges and the outsides of society. His elaborately interlaced drift works through the city streets can be read as a kind of movement at the outside of the outside, a refusal to be bound to the social body other than in an errant orbit of extremity. Yet here in the rope piece, Shea decides to move to a collaborative mode of durational performance and to directly engage with another performer. One might say, to address, embody, animate, particularize, and make visible the relation to the other that has ghosted some of his previous work. His understanding of the nature of this relation, somewhat distinct from Montano's with its stress on spiritual values, was made clear in an interview with Alex and Alison Gray towards the end of the performance. This is Shea. I wanted to do one piece about human beings and their struggle in life with each other. I find being tied together is a very clear idea because I feel that to survive, we are all tied up. We cannot go in life alone without people. Because everybody is individual, we each have our own idea of something we want to do, but we are together. So we become each other's cage. Shea's insistence here on the essential and ineradicable nature of social relations may seem surprising <coughs> for an artist whose art practice has moved through passages of profound isolation. But Shea's use of durational performance as a limit test of subjectivity repeatedly engaged with questions of encounter with the alterities <coughs> of the self. However, in Rope Peace, this ethos is oriented through artistic collaboration toward a concrete encounter with a particular other and the alterities arising in the duration of this binding. Significantly, Shea sees interdependency as a precondition of survival, but also as a trap. Whilst Shea and Montano made an, ex an extraordinary commitment to a sustained intersubjective encounter with difference and otherness, they were both acutely aware and the rope makes this apparent and felt, that their social relation involves their subjection to each other's body and will. One might say, following Levinas, 
that each is the other's hostage. The row piece is in fact constituted through the durational movement of this giving over of the self to the other. And it's this kinetic content of intersubjectivity that forms the focus of its ethical process. After it encompassed their waists, the rope that bound Shay and Montana, though eight feet in length, stretched to a radius of only five and a half feet when absolutely tall. In effect, their lives were marked by extreme proximity, lived inside a prohibition on both spatial separation and touch. The rules of this work then laid out highly restric restrictive kinetic conditions in which this intimacy had to be conducted. All significant movement was subject to the physical or verbal agreement of the other. Heightened physical activity was conditioned by the other's corporeality and movement. These rules meant that there was no privacy for each other, since each was always in the same place within a limited proximity. What one did, the other necessarily shadowed or witnessed. In this performance, a radial object of determined extension traversed sensate relations and all movement. Consequently, each body was kept in orbit of the other. Shay's invocation of cosmic orders as determinants of duration was directly figured here. A highly symbolic daily snapshot of Shay in Montana, a similar image later circulated as the work's closing poster, even pictures them standing in front of the 1964 World's Fair Unisphere, Unisphere in Queens, ringed by multiple steely orbits. The kinetic conditions under which Shea and Montano performed for the year would also have generated kinesthetic reattunement. Each other's sensorium was reconditioned through this bound intimacy. Making highly evident to the performers, if not to their observers, that the corporeity of the other is always imbricated within one's sense of oneself. Here the performers are engaged in a mutual durational sensory intrusion or enfolding without bring, bringing their bodies to the point of touch. This proximate intertwining necessarily involved the experiencing of most of the biological functions of the other, but they limited the sexual to the solitary or the imagined. By their very nature, the rules of this work instigate an insistent dehabituation of somatic practices and senses thereby estranging embedded understandings of relation. As Montano remarked, I'm forced to remain alert and attentive because I'm doing something different from what I ordinarily do. The task of being tied is so difficult and absorbing that I can only do just that. Shay and Montano doubtless became habituated, habituated to some dynamics of their constraint, learning to adapt their physical decision-making, thoughts and social practices to their altered and remorselessly interdependent conditions. But these spatial and fleshly dynamics were inseparable from temporal conditions. The duration of the performance so secures the artwork's status as an altered life. Duration is constituted here by the giving over of one's time to the time of the other. Habituation remains incomplete. Each cannot choose the time of their agency is dependent on the other's time. They live, therefore, in a time frequented by the phenomena of waiting and deferral. A year of two lives is spent in a time attendant to another time. In the wake of Caprao's happenings, artistic collectivity was an established principle within artistic scenes. And though individualism in the art world was and still is a reigning force, Dual collaborative performance works of this kind were not unprecedented. Shea and Montano can, however, be credited with extending the duration of a single collaborative work beyond previously established limits. Abramovich and Ulay's series of relation works, performances made whilst they were sharing an itinerant life, provide a revealing counterpoint with Shea and Montano's piece. Beginning with um, an explosive choreography of attraction and repulsion in their um, exemplary 
first word, relation with space. Uh, which is in 1976, and ending with a slow uh, movement. Of cleaving and conciliation in the Lovers' Great War War, 1988. Abramovich and Ulane made a series of durational works in distinct localities, deploying simple actions without rehearsal, planned ending, or subsequent repetition, that tested their bodily limits in relation. As Abramovich remarked, her works with Ulane were founded on their love, and as the retroactive title of their final work suggests, The Lovers' Great War. War. This figuration of two lovers is integral to all of the relation work. In relation in space, this is the image of me now, performed at the Venice Biennale, the naked couple repeatedly walked toward and then away from each other, brushing as they passed. Their movements accelerated over the 58 minute duration of the piece, so that glancing blows transformed into dynamic collisions, and the action of magnetic polarization was marked with the rawness of fleshly encounter and the realities of human exhaustion. The relation words have often been read as dialogues on gender difference and either interpreted as unwitting reiterations of the patriarchal power relation inherent in the cultural inscription and coding of gender, or as a radical opening out of such constructs within the logics of heterosexual relations. Both resonances are present within these works. The enduring strength of the relational works is their capacity to mark the transactions, affects, and dissolutions of power through the intertwining of flesh in breath, voice, touch, and choreographies of co-action. These interrogations of gendered relation are loaded with the energetics of desire. Abramovich and Mule figure themselves in actional choreographies of compulsive push and pull. They encounter, resist, and attempt to surpass material and fleshly limits in order to attain a resolutely elusive equilibrium or union. Their relation is traversed by expressions of intensities and their dissolution, refusal and acceptance, pain and ecstasy. One can read Imponderabilia, 1977, where the naked couple formed the lips of a gender-polarized entrance into the gathering as a work whose kinetics and symbolism are caught up in the passage Caress and Frisson of couplings in inherent interloper or third party, and thus with the incessant movement of desire. Predictably, the police stopped the performance. The evident dualisms of these relation works are somewhat dissolved in their later performances, the early distinctions of role through the separation of action and speech, are not sustained, and the use of visible flesh which firmly marks the works of material encounters of distinct genders is discarded. As Katarzyna Michalak has noted, there was a significant genetic shift across Abramovich and Ulay's relation works as they developed over time. The agitation, speed, volatility, and exhaustion of the early works, like relation in space, is succeeded by the serene composure of the couple's um, vigils in night sea crossing, and the steady labor of their long walk along the Great Wall toward the closure of their collaboration. The interrogative drive of these insightful relations with their stripping out of aesthetic excess and material distraction, resolves down in stillness and quietude to the resounding choreographic phrases of meeting, facing, and parting. Peggy Phelan has astutely drawn a correspondence between the singularities of performances of intersubjective relation and the formulations of ethics in the work of the philosopher Emmanuel Levin. For Levinas, ethics arises in the face-to-face -face encounter with another. Phelan traces this encounter through her relation to Abramovich's later audience relation work, The House with the Ocean View. Abramovich's focus 
after the close of the works with you like, have turned over many years of performance practice to the question of energy exchange with the observer. This exchange is read uh, by Phelan as an illumination of the, quote, mutual and repeated attempt to grasp, if not fully apprehend, consciousness as simultaneously intensely personal and immensely vast and impersonal. Less grasping than caressing, Phelan's multiple writings on Abramovich's work are a responsive extension of the critical and cultural terms of, quote, the unpredictable course of the social event, therein convened. In this enactment of critical ethics, Phelan articulates the resilient resistance of performance to commodification and its troubling as structures of representation and knowledge. Interestingly, for Levinas, this facing is not, as one might assume, a necessarily frontal affair, an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball relation, as it is frequently manifested by the theatrical mise-en-scene of the house with the ocean view. Nor is it registered at the level of appearance. Levinas says, quote, you turn yourself towards the other as toward an object. The encountering of otherness is not found in an object of vision as such, but in the movement of turn, in the dance of proximity, the inclination of the corporeity of subject. Moreover, for Levinas, ethics emerges not in the content or meaning given by a person or a work of art in what is said, but in the very act of saying. One might read in Shea and Montano's long dance of proximity the giving over of the will and consciousness of each other to the other, and therein a rendition of durational performance as an ethics of facing. Spanning the years 1983 to 84, the road piece took place at the midterm of Abramovich and Ulay's occasional series of touring and mutilating vigils that formed Night Sea Crossing. Jane Montano's innovation in this light book was to subject everyday kinetic figurations of meeting, facing, and parting to the phenomena of material constraint and extended duration. Both couples were by this time aware of each other's work, and though they were not in a direct artistic dialogue across continents, one of Shay's and Montano's daily snapshots records a visit to Bramovich and Ulay in May. Before they began their work together, however, Shea and Montano were relatively unknown to each other. They were not intimate collaborators in life, but convened their durational <coughs> intimacy perilously and quite exceptionally under the sign of art. Montano had not met Shea before 1983, but was alerted to his work through his, quote, soulful posters of the outdoor piece, and had asked the performance curator Martha Wilson to put them in touch. Shea was already looking for someone with whom he could be tied. Within the determining rule system of their performance, whilst intercorporeity was heightened, physical union was banned, and the sexual was marginalized. Consequently, the energetics of this work are quite distinct from the relations. Shea and Montano's piece is less concerned with the animus of desire in heterosexual union, and more focused on a terrain of questions to do with other intersecting elemental dynamics of social relation, hospitality, civility, and ethics. Shea and Montano were not only different genders, they were working from quite distinct perspectives around aesthetics and the social and spiritual functions of art. They made a year-long accommodation of these differing understandings of the relations of art. Moreover, as they belonged to different ethnicities, visibly marked in their skin. Their cultural makeup and therefore their embodied understandings and practices of interpersonal relation were thoroughly distinct. In its heterogeneous invocation of the many acts of sociality and relation that make a life, the road piece is a lived meditation on the questions of social and personal civility, of the social being for the other that founds all being, of the movements of relation therein transacted. Art, like one year performance 83 84, is then figured as a cohabitation with a stranger. It's focused on the question, it focuses on the question of dwelling together, a 
dwelling that is always constituted by being with another in a fluid state of non-belonging. This founding estrangement is marked in an array of terms across the world, including, but by no means re reducible to gender or to ethnicity. Shane Montano deployed a systematic documentary strategy. Taking agreed daily snapshots and making daily tapes of their conversations. This is a marked departure from the regulated forms Shane had previously used in his year long works. The amateurish, but low tech feel of the photographs, alongside their variation of subject and pose, secures the work's estrangement with a certain everydayness against which the performance's unusual kinetic relation sits. This um, inclusion of everyday life, the principal strategy of Montano's work up to and beyond this point, injects the vastly heterogeneous quality of the quotidian into the work and bolsters its social address. In their serial photographs, Che and Montano appear as restless and dislocated figures, hardly ever finding a context in which they can look and be at home. As performing subjects, they're always on the move, and the observer is left to oscillate across these serial images between interiors and exteriors. On one occasion, Shea and Montano are even pictured in a visual echo of Shea's outdoor piece beside a brazier in an area of wasteland. Place is given to placelessness, and sight appears to be under construction. The observer is left as one is whenever one views the personal snapshots, snapshots of people one does not know, with a profound sense of removal from the relation or sight within which the image would be meaningful. Whilst the general array of these photographs is intriguing in its invocation of a time and style of existence, the mundanely quirky quality of the images is punctuated by the insistent strangeness of the couple's bound relation, and by ruptures and anomalies in the banal surfaces of the form. Shay and Montano's inability to get along, to collaborate as human beings, as Shay put it, is visibly marked within this photographic documentation of the work. On difficult days, the performing subjects declined to appear before the agreed daily snapshot and the camera could only record a resonantly blacked out, but nonetheless time-stamped image. These refusals or discretions are later replaced by images of the word fight, which appear to be scrawled on the remnants of the destroyed art form. But as both Shea and Montano have separately remarked, these negativities differences, antagonisms, and violent disagreements, though perhaps lamentable in human terms, are an integral, integral part of the work's strength of address. Within a work in which the literal binding and the social and artistic bond between the performing subjects was not to come, these blanked days remind the observer of the failures of consensus and understanding that are an integral value of any social contract. They trace the endurance and accommodation of difference inherent to civil relations. Most remarkable, perhaps, is the second uh, documentary strategy, which can be seen as a fusion of Shea and Montano's sensibilities, and perhaps a resolution of the distinct temporalities on which their individual works had been based. Up to and after this work, Montano maintained a strong interest in the forms and affects of testimony and confession. Her last work before she entered the Zen Mountain Monastery from which she emerged in order to collaborate with Shea was the now renowned Mitchell's Death, a scripted performance work that was made into a powerful performance video in 1980. In the video version, Montano's ghostly face, floating in a void and adorned with acupuncture needles, recounts the traumatic hearing of the news of her ex-husband's death from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and her journey across psychological and physical distance to attend and once more touch his body, 
before its cremation. This journey is, of course, a recursive movement towards the resolutely unanswerable question of the meaning of death, a linguistic work of mourning. The performance's shuddering testimonial stream is a form of recounting of the emotions, logics, and senses encountered in this process. As traumatic testimony, the work reiterates the force of the event for which it acts as witness. The collapse of understanding inherent to the witnessing of death is reiterated in Montano's breathless song of Mitchell. And as she touches her auditor's ear, the audience becomes death's haunted witness too. Mitchell's death reflects an interest in the temporality of event grief, a shattering recursion that comes to trouble the consistencies and verities of memory, knowledge, and record. In joining Shea in a year-long exploration of bound into subjectivity, Montano commits herself to another kind of binding union and another temporality of duration. But as we've seen in his previous works, Shea has manifested a total disinterest in the expressive capacities of speech, except as forms of sub subversive legal declaration. This disinterest was not just a product of sensibility, but a reflection of ethnic, cultural, and legal differences. Shea and Montano then recorded daily testimonies of their year-long performance on numbered and dated tape cassettes, but their co-signed sealing of each tape withdraws from audition the oral testimony of their exchanges within the work, and it does so for all time. In withholding this testimony of their exchanges of difference, whose presence is keenly felt in its absence, the work calls attention to a defining but inaccessible and now inaudible locus. This whole one year performance then, is rendered in the bringing together of multiple durational acts, serial photography, and withdrawn oral recording. To see, or rather to witness the life work, the observer must negotiate these self-negating and mutually resonating forms. The observer is faced, therefore, with the correspondence between an enactment of an everyday choreography within a prohibition on culture, a banalization and blanking of the work of sight, and an extensive spoken disclosure permanently withdrawn from hearing. This complex realignment of the powers and relations of the senses of the observer is the principal dynamic of the work's effective form. It commits the exchange, the content of intersubjective relation, at the heart of this work, to a zone of insensibility and unrepresentability, and thereby preserves something of its singularity. Shane and Montano's use of the orbits, flows, and transactions of relation and their possibility in terms of a performance ethics is particularly interesting in the context of recent art theory, which has been gripped by the question of the social, social efficacy of relation in art. In his influential book, Relational Aesthetics, Curator and writer Nicholas Guria identified a 1990s resurgence of, quote, artistic practices which take as their theoretical and practical point of departure the whole of human relations and their social context, rather than an independent and private space. As a proto-manifesto explicitly written in the spirit of avant-gardism, Guria's provocation is prone to absolute terms and rhetorical flourishing what artists could make a start from the whole of human relations. However, Burio's book makes an important call in its proposition of an aesthetic theory in which artworks would be assessed by, quote, the interhuman relation which they represent, produce, or prompt. Most of the works discussed in relational aesthetics enact or facilitate interactive relations with audiences and are concerned with dynamics of community or of collective formation. Therein, Guriot locates a fecund and radical force, 
and an array of socializing, holistic, and emancipatory intent. The aesthetics of the artist Murillo discusses of Felix Gonzalez Torres emerges as an exemplar amongst many others, are somewhat distinct from the work under consideration here, which is not installational or object-focused. But for Murillo, the vital issue across many of these works is their use and production of intersubjective encounter, their inclusion of the other within the work of art, and their deployment of, quote, being together. Gonzalez Torres's work is read, for instance, in terms of its use of pairing and coexistence, and thereby its production of a meeting between two realities. In a daringly ACC historical statement, Murillo um, asserts that relational art's basic claim the sphere of human relations as art work venue has no prior example in art history. And on this basis, a new era of artistic function is declared. The role of artworks is no longer to form imaginary and utopian realities, sick, but to actually be ways of living and models of action within the existing real. Yet, as we've seen in the works of Shea and Montano and Abramovich and Lowe, this basic claim and its attendant actions were already well advanced from the mid-1970s and throughout the 1980s. Following such assertions, the debate on relational aesthetics has surprisingly paid very little attention to the aesthetic principles and philosophical coordinates of its antecedents in the rich veins of performance art and life. These works are vital to this debate precisely because of their sustained uh, aesthetic examination of the means and powers of relation in a living art. Setting aside the complex question of curatorial and critical investments in the recognition and constitution of art movements or moments, it undoubtedly forms an animus of the subsequent relational aesthetics debate. The many critical responses to Burio's book have questioned the social efficacy and relative content of the works he discussed. The critique has focused in particular on the qualities of relation such works propagate and the relationship of these relations to political values and to forms of capital exchange, particularly those emerging in an experienced economy. This discussion emerges from Burriel's use of the Marxian notion of the social interstice as a model for creative community, the space of exchange that is removed from the law of profit, and thus suggests possibilities of relation outside of capitalized forms of exchange. Claire Bishop's interrogation of Burriel's constellation of relational art as a proto-movement has focused on what she perceives as an easy assumption that dialogue, in and of itself, carries inherent critical, political, or democratic value. She heavily questions the equality of relations produced, in, sorry, the quality, the good brilliant, of relations produced in the artworks Burio has presented in curatorial and critical terms, particularly their modes of conviviality. Following the social theories of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. She advocates aesthetic practices, Santiago Sierra and Thomas Hirschen are offered as examples, that she sees as deploying and inspiring a more antagonistic, and therefore it seems, more extensive and productive understanding of social relations. However, as Grant Watson has articulated, in her quest for more political content within a relational aesthetic, and more detailed analysis of Bishop underestimates some of the challenges, both in Burio's theory and relational work, to the constitution of subjectivity that forms a significant dynamic of its ethical aspect. There is an assumption here that the content of intersubjective relation, the said rather than the same, the values therein transacted, would be its radical form. 
Whilst Bishop acknowledges following the higher move that social antagonism arises from the desire and the inability of individual subjects and social bodies to constitute themselves as whole, she seems to underestimate the capacities of formal self-interrogation and self-opening within an aesthetic to investigate what Bailey termed the unpredictable force of the social event. This force of intersubjective exchange, as it is manifested in the work of Shea and Montal, may not, as Bishop wishes, be reducible to content or values or affect that can be narrated in retrospect by its participating subject, or indeed by the art historian. The ethical facing which relational art may enact carries an inassimilable singularity. Bishop's response to Burio, you, you see that the Bishop Burio is the sort of third pairing of the, the paper, is an attempt to deepen the politics of the terms of relational art and to expand its ambit to works that Bishop sees as less complicit with market value. Perhaps it's Burio's omission of artistic antecedents investigating relation in performance and live art that often leads him to transient, gainful, and careless formulations of intersubjectivity. For whilst he's happy with the idea of the encounter inherent to a relational aesthetic as a form of facing, he dismisses Levinas's invocation of this facing as a bond of responsibility, finding within it a burdensome moral weight and a lamentable reduction of intersubjectivity to what he calls a kind of inter-servility, servility. In effect, he confuses ethics with morals. As Shannon Jackson has argued in her thoughtful reading of the restorative and communitarian responsibilities inherent in Gonzalez Torres' work, if Levinas's ethical paradigm emphasizes a relationality with an other that we do not choose, and whose claims are not alterable by one. Burio, by contrast, emphasizes a relationality that sounds infinitely revising. Burio was writing in the social and aesthetic wake of the new technologies of connectivity that pluralize, um, but also accelerate human relations, creating social conditions of superfluid affinity. But Jackson's point still stands. For what form of intersubjectivity or sociality, whatever the medium of its realization, could be free from the emotional, sensate, psychological call of others? This is a call from which one cannot hang up. The claims of others by which the social subject is bound cannot be determinable by that subject's will. This call, as Shea and Montano understood, is one that cannot be put away. It insists, it insists on a continuous reorientation. An ethical relation is not the acquisition of a subject in a momentary transaction. The artwork of facing is not a mere gesture, a glance or a transient exchange. Ethics is a matter of relation explored through embodied duration. It was this being for the other, this company of strangers and its inherent unbidden aspect that Shea and Montano set out to explore. In their long movement through difference, through conflicts and their resolution and irresolution, they traversed and traced a life work in the irrepressible tone the other. Their giving over of their selves in orbit of the other invokes the commitment to movement, duration, and daily opening, one might say the life space required in order to survive social relations. That's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I open the floor and um, let me just see uh, for the internet audience, which is also, I think, available on chat line. 
in case the question comes from uh, outside. Can you hear me now, uh, uh, Graham, or am I not on? Am I not on audio? Uh, just wondering. Uh, <laughs> ah, okay. So if I'm near the mic, I, I can be heard to translate the question from the floor. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Then I would suggest you allow me to moderate and uh, speak up a little bit, and then I'll, we'll see whether the question can be perhaps answered in, in a way that the internet audience will understand uh, the context of the question. Please. We can have multiple layers of translation. <laughs> <laughs> More observation, really, is that it is surprising that divinational art debate does seem to want to say it starts in the 90s and, and ignores all of those things not just in the 80s, but also posits itself as a kind of reconfiguration of 60s positions, whereas in fact things have been that period if not before, it's just as much of a kind of attempt at denominational ethics and things like participatory groups for social dignity, for example, that just go straight into that area. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting that it seems to want to say it starts from the 90s. And um, I don't think the internet audience could hear him, so could you maybe just rephrase this question and <laughs> <laughs> And then maybe you can translate no. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I mean, Barry, I think you were just sort of saying it, it, it seems rather strange that it's mm. that, that um, relational aesthetics is, is ignored. It's, it's pre-history, particularly in performance. Yeah. Um, and, and this, this is um, it's very much my, my, uh, my point in the paper, but trying to, in a sense, to intervene also in the terms of the debate um, through, round, uh, through which the question of relationality has um, uh, been ordered. Um, because it, it, it seemed to me that it was this, this whole, this historical whole, this a historicism, which was also creating a kind of gap in the discourse um, around um, relational uh, affect. Um, so um, on, on the one hand, Burio um, wants to um, uh, to, uh, in a sense, to dismiss a kind of um, a weight of um, human responsibility and wants to emphasize a certain kind of condition of play. And on the other end of the debate, Bishop wants to, um, to restore, in, in a certain sense, some, some ideas of, um, of content and of value and, and of um, political uh, affect and of definable political affect in community context. And so the debate seems to have got sort of polarized around those positions. And so I, in a sense, what I was wanting to do was to use this work as, as a kind of test site in, in, in between those polarities um, to see what, um, what space might be opened up by the work in relationship to co the questions of that. Mm -hmm. And in particular, to think about the kinetic um, uh, dynamics of, uh, of that space. Which, it, which I think are deeply related to, the, to its ethical uh, powers, but are, are, are not so, so necessarily um, um, articulated within the uh, terms that Bishop uh, would have us sort of reconfigure the relational aesthetics today. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, displacement is worked by the internet aspect that seems to come into the world. Um, You mean more broad? Uh, so the question is, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do some translation again. The question is, is the, um, is the kinetic element of this debate displaced by um, the question of how we might uh, uh, discuss this in relationship to, um, to mediated conditions, to internet uh, relations? Yes, yes. Um, I definitely think that, that Burio is writing in a cultural context in which there is um, uh, a contraction of distance and, a, and because of that, um, a corresponding kind of fluidity of relation. Um, though 
don't like you would necessarily think that that leads to an absence of, of um, responsibility in relation to the other would, would be my uh, question really. because if anything what we see is that these um, forms of, um, of uh, distant intimacy are actually fraught by ethical and uh, moral uh, questions and um, they, they actually become the inherent uh, content of uh, so much our work that takes place within an intimate context as well, and particularly I think also within performance. So, um, um, I, I, I don't think that these these questions are displaced by technologies. If anything, they're perhaps perhaps being more acute. Uh, to follow up, there's a question coming from the internet. Uh, someone wanting to know how you feel about Raphael Lozano Hammer's work, who I think. Uh, deals both with concrete physical architectures in the urban yeah, context, but also using um, network technology to, to make this work. Um, I, um, I don't know how I feel about it, <laughs> because I don't, I don't know the work at all. Okay. Um, uh, it's the, the, the simple uh, okay. answer. Okay. I'm sorry. Mm. But it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very interesting. Do you want to say some more about it, Johannes? Because perhaps you know it. Do you know this work? Um, not necessarily. I think he only recently, I think, surfaced more here in the UK. I think he got a huge commission, I think, from uh, several cities here. But he, he did a piece in Mexico in the Zocalo, uh, wanting people from the from the urban community to to input the, uh, into the transformation of the Zocalo through some kind of network technology that also involves laser beams and uh, uh, sort of, um, I guess, contemporary, contemporary technological communication. Mm -hmm. It was about relating the square and the people to, I guess, contemporary communication systems. Mm -hmm. And the internet functioned as an input uh, device, so to speak. But, um, <coughs> I'm not sure, what, what is he doing in, in the UK? Does anyone know of his work here? So I, I think what, what, what may be interesting in relationship to this, this question of te technological interface and um, uh, uh, forms of representation um, of those interfaces is that here in Shay's work, what, what really interests me is, in a sense, the, um, uh, the denial of the expressive capacities of the forms. So, you know, the way in which um, the tapes are sealed um, there is uh, no audible testimony. Um, the, the photographs are frequently uh, blank. In fact, the, the sort of seriality of the form itself is a way of perhaps restoring a different kind of temporality to um, the photograph. So that uh, what one is, is getting in Shay's work across the one year performances is a, um, uh, a complex problematization of the forms through which um, the work could be uh, delivered to a wider audience. Mediate, mediate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, please. Um, a couple of things. One, one is um, in relation to Fourier's position that I sort of find that he conflates ideas of relativity and relation. Um, things being connected or different according to subjectivity, I think of as a position more like relativity. Yes. Um, whereas relation is a much more um, promiscuous position on both sides. Um, and I think a lot of the objections to him are actually running with the ball of the idea, but not saying that actually he's, he's saying something very specific. For example, when he talked about, um, say, Vanessa Beecroft, as an example of relational art, which I wouldn't think at all, because what he's really talking about is um, audience response and openness to interpretation, which is, it's just a whole other field of discussion to me. 
can I, I'll, I'll try and um, kind of reduce and <laughs> collapse your, your sophisticated, sophisticated point and for, the, for, the, um, for the microphone. It really, um, so we're talking about the way in which um, Burio's ideas of, of relational aesthetics either um, or com conflate uh, relativity uh, with relation. And, um, and that for, for you, Pierre, uh, relational, something relational is in inherently more pr promiscuous. Yeah. Um, uh, and that really what Burio, the kind of core principle for you that Burio is talking about are embodied, uh, embodied relation and physical sensory affect. Um, not even necessarily embodied relation. Um, Phenomenal. Openness, openness to interpretation. Yeah, and, and, and open interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, also isn't a particularly new idea. I mean, um, what's it called? Uh, response theory has been around for a while. Re reader response theory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but in well, that's what it's called in English, but actually in German, German, okay. it's called. Receptions aesthetic. Yeah, reception aesthetic. Yeah. Where he seems to be in some way coming out of without talking about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's interesting to me al also that, um, I mean, this is really interesting in relationship to Shay's work because to a lot, working on, on this work for some time, to a, to a large extent, one is really aware of the fact that, as a writer, you, you are making it up. Um, there is, um, I mean, despite the fact that they are um, uh, extensively documented, and there is a, a kind of machinic um, documentary relation across all of the one-year performances up to this point, um, because you are dealing with such vast tracks of time, um, the, the, the work is so open <coughs> to interpretation. And one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm struck by when reading um, other writing in response to Fichet is the way in which there is always, I think, if there is in my writing, this immense struggle to, to try and, and put some framework any framework really around the work, and also at the same time, the sense in which you are producing the work. This is very much, it's very evident that it is your projection into the work, your rendition of the work, and that that is, that is, is, is very visible. And this is something also that Le Ching uh, is, is quite um, keen to, to both propagate and to point out when the frames of interpretation are brought um, but yes, we want to ask, what is his own writing now about his own experience in um, the book? In, in the book, we, it's very similar to this strange uh, process that we're going through now of multiple <laughs> translations uh, into uh, forms of plausibility. Um, uh, we um, had a cor correspondence over a number of years, and I think over a period of uh, six to nine months, we had multiple meetings in which we had uh, dialogue. And um, we worked um, sometimes with a translator when we found that English um, was um, uh, not necessarily the best language through which to have our communication. And so we, we adopted a strange uh, relay. So I would be, of course, transcribing um, the things um, spoken words in, into a, a, a sort of in, into the interview format. And then um, this in English. And then this would be translated um, by this partner into Chinese. And then um, he would then speak his revisions to her. They would be rewritten uh, by her into English. Mm -hmm. And then I would then uh, have a negotiation with him about um, the, the rewriting uh, on that basis. So there was this very complex circular movement through different uh, languages um, 
uh, in terms of uh, the delivery of his voice, which in a way, in a, in a sense, sort of mirrors yeah. the work again, you know, that coming through these multiple um, forms of documentation or representation, um, which, which um, in some ways are uh, very insufficient and very ina inadequate to actually describe a durational exchange which we have. And one of the things that we were trying to do in making a, a monograph on his work that is a dialogic uh, monograph was to really think about um, what the um, restrictions of that uh, and conditions of that form might be. So um, what I wanted to do was to make a, a work that was um, uh, about uh, my relation to his documents and to his work, and then um, that, um, that would also contain our own dialogue, and then would also contain other people's responses to that work, mm -hmm. and then finally, in the end, uh, as it does with um, uh, Carol Becker's contribution uh, to the book, it contains a response to all of those multiple dialogues. So that what I was trying to, to do in the form of the book was to create an extensive set of conversations. And there is, in a sense, a kind of restorative energy um, to that, because I think the work has, his work has occupied this peculiar space where it has been um, uh, uh, sort of the stuff of legend, but has not actually really received very much serious interrogation or criticism or, or, or critical uh, extension. Um, so there is a kind of bringing into uh, historical narration. It's an act of bringing into historical narration mm. here. Mm. But at the same time, an attempt to be very um, careful uh, about what forms that assimilation takes mm. and also to pay attention to its um, to its um, social dynamics. It's a curatorial challenge too, if we were to do an, a show on him, yeah, on this artist. Um, yeah, though it's so, yeah, <laughs> curatorial challenge, um, though, uh, the